These muscles are an exceptionally well-known group of muscles to orthopedists as they account for a large share of office visits. These muscles make up some of the major muscles in the shoulder responsible for moving your arm. These four are the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis, which can be remembered with the memory aid, sits. To learn these muscles, I suggest you actually try to act out these motions yourself, and remember them accordingly. Nothing like some muscle memory to help you remember some muscles. The supraspinatus is mostly important for abducting the arm about 15 degrees. After that, the majority of abduction is taken over by the deltoid. People will complain that they can't lift their arm, but if they can get their arm up on a chair, they can often continue to lift it without difficulty. The next muscle is the infraspinatus, which is responsible for laterally rotating the arm. This is often injured by pitchers. Again, act out the motion for yourself. Next is the teres minor, which adducts and laterally rotates the arm. Finally, we have subscapularis, which adducts and medially rotates the arm. I know that was a little difficult, and it was a lot to take in, so let's go through it again one more time really quick. Supraspinatus abducts the arm about 15 degrees. Infraspinatus laterally rotates the arm. Teres minor adducts and laterally rotates the arm. Subscapularis adducts and medially rotates the arm. Let's try applying this information to a question. Let's say a 50-year-old man presents to the ED because of severe pain with even slight abduction of his arm following a skiing accident. He's diagnosed with a rotator cuff tear. Based on this movement deficit, which muscle tendon do you think was injured? If you guess supraspinatus, you're correct. You could also have just played the percentages and still guess supraspinatus. That's because it's the muscle most commonly injured in a rotator cuff tear. We're not going to spend a ton of time on the bones of the hand and wrist, since it's fairly complicated and relatively low yield, but it's worth at least looking at so you have some frame of reference for certain upper extremity injuries that we'll talk about later on. Specifically, you may want to memorize the mnemonic for the different wrist bones that we have here. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle, for the different bones in order counterclockwise starting from the 8 o'clock position. If you commit any of them to memory, memorize the scaphoid, lunate, and hamate, as they're involved in some significant common injuries. Now we're about to dive into the heart of musculoskeletal anatomy for step one, the upper extremities. Let's start with the anatomy of the brachial plexus, which serves as a good conceptual foundation for understanding the rest of the upper limb. Why do we help ourselves remember the brachial plexus by going over it together? Let's start with the nerve roots, C5 through T1. Keep in mind, however, that though there are cervical nerves 1 through 8, there are actually only 7 cervical vertebrae. C8 comes out below the C7 vertebra. All the other nerve roots come out above their vertebrae. Let's look at the trunks next the upper, middle, and lower trunk. After this, you get to the divisions, between which there's some crossing over, so the names get complicated and are fairly unimportant. Next are the cords, the lateral, posterior, and medial cords. These are named for their positions relative to the axillary nerve. The posterior cord splits off into the major extensor nerves of the limb, the axillary nerve, and the radial nerve. Therefore, a posterior cord lesion will cause problems with extension. These are part of the last segment, the branches. The others come off of the lateral and medial cords and form the musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar nerves. As you can see in the schematic, there are five different sets of levels overall in the brachial plexus. You can remember the order of the levels with the acronym Randy Travis Drinks Cold Beer for roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. These four pictures are relatively high yield pictures of the major nerve branches and associated dermatomes for the upper extremity, including the hand. The first of these four pictures shows the brachial plexus and its distal branches superimposed onto a picture of the hand. It's worth having a rough idea of where each of the dermatomes lies in your mind because many questions will describe paresthesias in patches of skin and require you to know what nerve is involved. So, I would spend some time looking at the diagrams of the dermatomes on the screen here. As for the diagrams of the nerves in the arm and the hand, we'll be referring back to these when discussing injuries in just a moment. Let's start at the top and work our way down. While we won't be discussing all the branches we just mentioned, we'll go through some of the important ones. As we go through this, try to think about what level, that is root, trunk, division, cord, and branch, we're at, and then what the mechanism of the injury is, and if noted, what injury it causes. The first injury is the C7 root. If you think about where the C7 root is, you should imagine that only a very central injury could cause this type of problem. Barring something unfortunate like trauma, the common mode of injury for the C7 root, based on its location in the spine, is actually compression by a cervical disc. Next, we look at the upper and lower trunk injuries. The upper trunk is most commonly injured by trauma, especially direct trauma to the tip of the shoulder, and is called an herb Duchenne palsy, or colloquially as a waiter's tip palsy. You'll see this discussed in much greater detail in a few more pages.
In contrast to the upper trunk, the lower trunk is not as commonly injured by trauma, though it can be damaged by stretching injuries like trying to grab something while falling, but more commonly by compression. This compression can be from a variety of entities, usually something exotic. Classic board examples would be pancos tumors of the lung, that is, superior sulcus lung cancers, or a cervical rib, which is quite literally an additional rib attached to a cervical vertebra. Both cause mass effect on the lower trunk and lead to an array of injuries termed Klumpke's palsy or total claw hand, which we'll discuss in a few pages as well. The next set of injuries we'll look at are in the level of the end branches, namely the median, radial, and ulnar nerves. As we discuss these, pay close attention to the picture to see what portion of the nerve we're hitting. Namely, is it a proximal portion of the nerve, or is it distal? The proximal portion of the radial nerve is the axilla, so you would imagine compression for whatever reason, either having your arm flung over a chair, or using crutches incorrectly, could cause it to become injured. Moving along the course of the radial nerve, you'll notice it can be injured in the mid-shaft of the humerus, as the nerve hugs part of the bone relatively closely, in an area known as the spiral groove. Injury to bone, from any type of mechanical trauma, could also injure the radial nerve. Moving further along the bone, you'll notice more branches begin to appear, particularly as the nerve passes the elbow. If, for example, the radius is dislocated, the deep branch of the radial nerve may become stretched. Radial nerve injuries present classically with wrist drop, because the extensor muscles of the wrist lose their innervation. Memorize this injury, it's a common one. Now let's turn our attention to the axillary nerve. This nerve comes off of the brachial plexus early and posteriorly reaches its site of innervation. The nerve primarily hugs the surgical neck of the humerus, therefore if the humeral neck is fractured, it can injure the axillary nerve. A similar injury would result from the dislocation of the humerus or even an intramuscular injection, which often goes into the deltoid muscle, which is innervated strongly by the axillary nerve. This type of injury would manifest in a patient who has difficulty abducting his or her arm, which is the main function of the deltoid. The next nerve we'll look at is the median nerve. Proximal nerve injuries often don't occur until the median nerve approaches the elbow. When it approaches the condyles, it is vulnerable to compression by a supracondylar fracture of the humerus, which can lead to a pronator teres syndrome. Memorize this fact. More distally, and much more commonly, this nerve can be compressed once it enters into the carpal tunnel. In a similar location, it can be compressed by a dislocated lunate bone, which is another good thing to memorize. Even more distally, the recurrent branch of the median nerve moves in the direction of the thumb and is a very superficial structure. Superficial lacerations in the right area can cause injury to this nerve. Next, we look at the ulnar nerve. Proximal injuries of the ulnar nerve can occur with repeated minor trauma to the medial portion of the arm, where the ulnar nerve is still fairly superficial and accessible. This is the so-called funny bone. Proximal ulnar nerve injuries also occur by fractures of the medial epicondyle, more distally, the ulnar nerve can be lesioned when it is just beyond the wrist, or it can be lesioned by trauma to the heel of the hand or a fracture of the hook of the hamate, both of which we'll discuss in a moment. Don't confuse the lunate and the hamate in relation to the median and ulnar nerve injuries, respectively. The final injury that we will comment on is injury of the anterior interosseous nerve. This is an anterior nerve that exists in part between the radius and ulna and can be compressed in the deep forearm. Now we recognize what a whirlwind that was, but remember that we'll try to review the high yield parts of that image in subsequent sections. However, we'd advise coming back to this picture to remember where on the arm the injury often appears. As a breather, how about we try a question related to the information we've presented so far? Let's say we have a 20-year-old woman who presents to the ED with several deep lacerations on the medial side of her wrist after a suicide attempt. She receives prompt psychiatric evaluation. The function of what thumb muscles might be affected by these injuries? While this is a difficult question, remember to think about the location of the injury, which at its essence is at the opposite side of the wrist, from the thumb. Medial wrist injuries affect the ulnar nerve, and one of the only muscles that goes to the thumb that is innervated by the ulnar nerve is the adductor pollicis. The other three pictures, two of the dermatomes and one of the nerves and bones of the hand, are worth going over individually. We'll talk in brief about a couple of points, however, to clarify some injuries mentioned in the prior image. If you recall, we stated that the ulnar nerve can be injured by a fracture of the hook of the hamate. As you can see, the ulnar nerve actually passes through Guyon's canal, which is in part made up of the hook of the hamate. The proximity of the two makes it very likely that a fracture of the hamate would lead to an ulnar nerve injury. Also, you'll note that the flexor retinaculum is well indicated in this picture. This is the structure that creates the anterior boundary of the wrist, such that the median nerve is trapped if any inflammation from repeated minor trauma occurs. As you work your way through the two dermatome maps, imagine these images superimposed onto your own arms and hands, as it may help to remember the different regions. You can correlate these to the paths of the different nerves in the first image we discussed, and see how nerve roots and nerves move to cutaneous regions that fit their paths and trajectories. 